That was awesome, man. I don't know if I... I don't know if I know that song. Do y'all know that song? It was great. It was really nice. Sorry, I'm late. Elvis did that one. That was good. Um, yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, yeah, we pray. Let's get into the scripture today. We're going to look at kind of a troubling scripture today. It's not the one I wanted to preach about. Uh, uh, but uh, that's the thing with the scripture is it makes you look with eyes wide open at the realities of our existence and the ins and outs of uh, how things go and, and God dealing with us in different ways. And so uh, we're going to look at this today and try to unpack it a little bit. And uh, and yeah, so this is in this is the story of the people in Moses. And uh, we know the, the, that Moses went to Egypt and, and rescued uh, the people. And then they spend a lot of time in the, the desert for 40 years. Uh, making lots of mistakes and everything. But we're going to pick up at this particular place, uh, Exodus 20 and verse 1. It says, And God spoke all these words. I'm the Lord. Oh. Uh, okay, what's the next one, John? This is not the right scripture. <laughs> we put these slides together like months ago and they're and not there. What scripture uh, do you want? It's just. Uh, it is, uh, let me find it in my thing. We need, uh, we need Exodus 17, 3 through 7. Is it in there? I wonder what's going on with that. Yeah, because it's like, we're like doing the liturgy, but we're like off a few weeks or something. That's weird. Anyway, uh, uh, I can read it here. But it says, in those days, in their thirst for water, the people grumbled against Moses, saying, Why did you ever make us leave Egypt? Was it just to have us die here of thirst with our children and our livestock? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? A little more and they will stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, Go over there in front of the people, along with some of the elders of Israel, holding in your hand uh, as you go the staff with which you struck the river. I will be standing in front of you uh, on the rock in Horeb. Uh, and strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. The place was called Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled there and tested the Lord saying, Is the Lord not in our midst? And the word Meribah means quarrel. And so there is this big issue here. Uh, I'm going to read this psalm that's under it, Psalm 95. It's one, uh, just a couple of verses in Psalm 95, but this is a, a responsorial uh, psalm. But it says this, if today you hear his voice, uh, don't harden your heart. So this is psalm. So psalm is like written after all this stuff happens. And so they're kind of reflecting on this story in the psalms. And imagine a church song or something where we're in here singing about what happened once upon a time. And it says, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us acclaim the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us joyfully sing songs to him. So, so there's this idea of coming in and don't, don't, don't. AP and I were talking about that on the way down this morning. What's it mean to have a hard heart, Dad? I said, it's just to be closed. It's just to decide if you're hurt or something. We've all felt that way. Somebody's trying to make you feel better. You're like, no, no, I don't want that. I don't want anything. I want to go get by myself and. And I want to lick my wounds by myself. And, and you harden up to people. And when we're hurt, we tend to do that. And he's saying, don't do that. If you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart. In fact, what you should do is to, to sing joyfully and claim, acclaim the rock of your salvation. And start to think about the things that God has done. Right? Right? If today you're going through stuff, the tendency is going to be to say, you know what? God, I don't know if he hears me anymore. You know, I don't know if God loves me anymore. Maybe I'm too old. Maybe I'm too young. Maybe I did some things. He says, don't harden your heart. It says, if today you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Come, let us bow down and worship the Lord. Let us kneel before the Lord who made us. He is our God. We are his people, uh, the flock that he guides. So he's saying, look, you have to worship God because we're in covenant. You're his people. Nothing has changed. If today you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Oh, that today you would hear his voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah. 
as in the day of Massa in the desert where your fathers tempted me, they tested me, as though they, even though they had seen my works. They had seen the things I did, and they tested me, and they were hard anyway. And so those are the scriptures today, a fun, a fun devotional for us to consider um, today. Uh, I have a little bit of, of thoughts about all this stuff. There, uh, nobody plays a bigger care, uh, part in the scripture than Moses. Moses considered a Christ-like character in the scripture. He, he, he uh, delivers the people through the Red Sea. It's a Christ figure, you know, like we're delivered through the blood of Christ. We go through the blood of Christ. And so Moses is like this guy, like he can't do anything wrong. Now we see that he's done a bunch of things wrong. He kills this guy and he has to go to the desert for 40 years. He's a fugitive. God says, go back to Egypt. There's, a, you know, there, there, there's some mistakes there. But generally in terms of how Moses has led his people, he does the right thing. He's a Christ figure. He goes through all kinds of issues with him, but this, this scripture doesn't show it. But what happens here is these, they're in the desert. They're thirsty. They want some water. They start to complain, and they say, give us some water like they always do, just like some kids coming to mom and dad saying, look, we need some. You know, we got a problem. You need to solve it. And uh, so Moses says, all right, we're going to solve it. God says, strike the rock, uh, or speak to the rock. There's a little discrepancy there about what's supposed to happen. Moses is mad. He hits the rock. He misrepresents or mis, uh, represents God in front of people. And, and God says, that's it. You're not entering the promised land. You're not getting anything. It's, it's, it, you're not going to move forward to the promised land. And gives him very se- severe punishment over this. And it seems very unfair. It makes us be afraid of God. It makes us think that if God's in a good mood, we're gay. If he's in a bad mood, we're in trouble. Um, there's a bunch of stuff like that. But there is a pattern of established in this uh, Old Testament story. So you remember when they're all hanging out at the mountain and Moses goes up on the mountain and all the people say, sit around and they start to like go nuts and they make a golden calf and worship all these gods what happens? God gets mad. His wrath is all kindled up. He's like, I'm going to destroy these people. And what happens? Moses says, hey, hey, hey. No, 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 God. You're, you're good. Don't do that. that does, that's not like you. That's not like how you are. You're good and loving God. And what would people think? And God says, you know what? You're right. You know what? You're right. And that's uh, and so he says, I'm not going to do that. And then they go a little, uh, then another time in the desert, they're out there in the desert. And uh, uh, they don't want to cross the promised land. They get all the way up to the promised land, and they're like, oh, man, we're scared. We saw giants out there. We're scared. We're not going to do it. Makes God mad. His, fi- his, 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 his anger is kindled up. He's like, fine, I'm going to get rid of these people. I'm going to get some people that have some guts and walk across the promised land and be my people like I've asked them to be and do the stuff I need them to do. And Moses says, hey, hey, wait, man, God we've gone so far. Why would you do that now? Like, come on. You, that, that, that far be it from you to do such a thing like that. And God says, you know what? You're right. You're right. But, but, but none of these people are going to come in. This generation is going to pass away and the next generation will go in because they didn't believe me. So there's like, there's like a, a plan and then there's a disobedience and then there's a wrath. But then there's a Moses who comes in and he intercedes and God either changes his mind or more like what I think is really happening, Moses passes the test. God knows that the people are like sheep. God knows that the people are going to be hungry today and thirsty tomorrow. Just like you know your little kids are going to get tired and sad and they're going to lose their stuff. And it doesn't matter if they're 12 or 15 or 7, you know, like they just find their fuse. And at the end of that fuse, they just start to lose it. So God's like aware of how the kids are. But Moses is holding to a different scenario. He's not holding Moses to the same scenario. And what happens? Every time that God, every time that Israel disobeys, God gets mad, but then Moses intervenes. So I start to wonder, does God get mad because he's just like an alcoholic dad like we talked about? Or does he need Moses to step up and realize that this is not good either? And Moses to step up and intervene. And so in, in a lot of ways, a lot of people think that the is, people of Israel were never being tested. It was always Moses that was being tested. 
Let me ask you something. If you're six year old and you're eight year old or you're two year old or you're three year old or your proverbial whatever kids you have, if they're acting crazy, they're acting, they didn't get their cool whip on top or they got onions on their hamburger and you're in the car and they're losing their minds. Well, who needs to keep their nose, the six year old or the adult? Amen. Because I'll lose my freaking mind and say, you know what? There's people starving to death. You're spoiled, rotten little brats. You act like everything's supposed to be like Barbie Land. It's not that way. So you shut your mouth and eat your food or don't eat anything. Well, who's acting like a kid? Like, they're six, man. They've got nothing to go on except their emotions. Who's supposed to be the grown man that's supposed to keep his wisdom and know what to do and not act like a kid and not make a big problem? And who always makes a big problem? Bad, ugly problem. So who's God trying to deal with? You're right, Bo, that your six-year-olds are just spoiled. Like, let's just mash them into the ground some more. No, he might be like, hey, you know what, son? You need to start growing up. It's on you. Yeah, they're your kids. Yeah, they're helpless. You knew that. You're the one acting like a kid. We're the ones acting like babies. Moses hitting this rock and acting, and he, he lost it. Every other time before, Moses, the leader, had said, No, God, I know you. You're good. That's not your character. What would other people think? It just doesn't add up. And God always is like, You're right. Here, though, this happened a bunch of times. Here, though, they're complaining again. But this time, God just said, give them some water. Moses is patted. They don't deserve any freaking water. They don't deserve anything. I'm sick and tired of these freaking Israelites. I'm sick and tired of dealing with them in the desert. I'm sick and tired of them complaining. Whack, he hits that rock. He don't, they don't deserve it anymore. And so Moses has failed the test because he's not intervening. He's not being that mediator. These deaf and dumb sheep are just moving around in circles. We know where they are. But Moses, you've seen my hand. You've heard my voice. We speak as though face to face. We're in a different thing altogether. You know me. You know the mercy. You know that, I, that, I, that, that, that this has always been the plan for my people. And you've been my God to help me lead these people. And you did good, but you know what? You messed up here. And it's a problem. It's a problem. And so what you hear about after this is Moses saying, hey, don't be like that time in Parabah. Like, you, and, 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 and there's this weird thing because you have to look at different places in the scriptures. In some places, it looks like he's blaming them. You know, like, like we do. Like, you kids have made me so mad that look what you made me do. And now I've done this. Put it on your kids. The six-year-old didn't know. But we put it on the kid, you know. you Look what you made me do. There's a, I, I had a friend one time that said that somebody else was, he was in 12-step. He said somebody was threatening his sobriety. He said, that, boy, that man over there is threatening my sobriety, and that's life and death. And I'll never forget this other person stepped up and said, your sobriety is your problem. You never put your, that is a massive issue. It's what you can't ever put your sobriety on, on the shoulders of somebody else. And that guy sat down. He was right. But don't we want to do that, friends? When we, when we don't do it right, when we mess it up, it's like, no, the woman that you gave me, she, the woman that the, she ate the fruit. It's like, I didn't do it. But this story is, is, is I think about, it's not necessarily about the people not doing what we want them to do. It's about are we doing what we know God's called us to do and are we walking in accordance with how we know God has always walked? Look, the precedent in the scriptures is what gives us a lot of faith today, isn't it? I mean, we didn't wake up this afternoon or like a month ago and say, you know, I like this Bible. Like the leather looks genuine. It's kind of cool. I'll get into it. No, it's like, no. This is like proven over and over again. Like our parents did it, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, like everybody I know found wisdom and guidance and direction through these, through these stories. And the character of God is resembled here so clearly. 
So what do we do when we go through and we get the stories? Now, if you take one little snapshot of God, then you get one little idea. But if you read all these stories, you get a big snapshot of God. And what is one thing that's said about God? Wait, like God is the same yesterday and today and forever. And God is faithful, right? And he's, he, he is always faithful to his covenant. He never, ever is going to give up on that covenant. And this warning is for us to not give up on the covenant. We're the ones that change our minds. We're the ones where the circumstances change and all of a sudden we're not thinking the same way, you know? I mean, think about it, friends. I mean, five years ago, was God different than he is today? The world is different. Like, we're concerned about different things. Like, all of a sudden we have phones and, you know, the world's changed. But, but God has not changed. And his dealing with his people has never changed. So, this is really speaking to me today, but as the Christian people that should know better, and as the Christian leaders, woe are we if we start deciding that we're going to change the rules. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be the guy saying, well, I don't know. I think it works this way. Who cares? You know? We see a precedent of how God is. And I think it's our job as Christians to say, no, no, no. We're mediators. We're standing in the middle. We're standing in the gap between the world and him. And we're saying, no, God, no, God. You love these people. You know, we, 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 we've learned enough about God, right, that we should know better. And I wonder if, like a lot of this stuff, we're always praying for God to do it, but he's like, no, no, I ask you to do it. Uh, uh, Oswald Chambers says, you never pray for God to do things that he's asked you to do. You don't ever pray for God to do something when he's asked you to do that something. Go help those people, God. Go Help them. Help them. I pray this. God, help them receive the gospel message somehow. Help them hear the gospel message somehow. Send them somebody, God, where they could hear the gospel message. You care enough to pray, but you don't care enough to go and give them the gospel message. Do you believe the gospel message? Do you believe it has the power to bring somebody from death to life? That person is you. You're hoping that God's going to fly a helicopter down to South Mississippi to meet your great uncle in Wiggins and help him find the Lord? Like, maybe you should call him. You've got credibility. So we got to be careful. And I guess I'm just trying to bring this into a little bit of a, a warning for us because this is what it's supposed to be. Don't think for a minute that God doesn't love us, that doesn't want the best for us, that there's not grace and mercy and overabundance of those kinds of things. But friends, don't think for a minute that you can't that, that he won't let you walk off a cliff. And don't think for a minute that he won't let you wad up the covenant agreement you have and throw it in the trash can. Then he doesn't mean that he's not faithful anymore. The warning is that we stay faithful, you see. The warning is that we have to keep assessing and saying, man, this covenant is still here. Am I still in it? We were talking earlier this morning. Like sometimes you, you get to communion and you're like, oh, shoot. I haven't assessed in a while. I'm still here, but apparently, well, that's what it is. We're just reassessing. We're, 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 we're bringing ourselves back up to this covenant, to this covenant over and over again. And friends, I don't know where the promised land is for us. I don't know what that means. I mean, the metaphors have to break down at some point. Did Moses make it to heaven? I think so. You know, was God really hard and, and really difficult with him in this situation? Maybe so, but, but he's a leader. And he knew better, and and he misrepresented God in some ways. And so I just want us to be careful as a church. I'm speaking to myself. I feel like I've done this before. I feel like I just laid down my covenant and threw it away. I feel like I got tired and said, I don't know if he listens anymore. I don't know if this stuff works anymore. I don't know if I believe this anymore. I don't know if I'm good anymore. The good thing about God is he changes not. And while I changed, and he can handle my pain and my issues in my rabbit trails he can handle that stuff he's big enough he can handle my honesty a lot better than my dishonesty probably and when i've come back friends it's stronger and so in some ways i feel like god's punishment god's discipline you know the, the word discipline in the scripture always means to teach i mean we got bad ideas about that from from you know getting spanked or whatever but it's to teach. God is a good God. It says we don't have, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, 
It says, don't despise the discipline of the Lord. For whoever the Lord loves, he disciplines and scourges every son whom he receives. So Moses getting discipline from God in some ways means that God cares. And that God loves him enough to not let him do stuff that screws up a bunch of stuff, right? The other day, uh, we, last week, we were at a soccer get, uh, tournament for uh, Ann Pasley's age. AP's eight. So, like, she's learning how to spell words, okay? Like, it's not, they're pretty young. Man, this old referee, the, the, the girl would throw the ball in and step on the white line. Beep! Blue ball. She stepped on the line. It would be like an inch. She was like, she barely stepped on the line. I'm like, Whoa, okay, okay. And the next girl, she lifts up her foot. Ah, lift it up your foot. You should lift it up that much. I could just hear it down the, but then I realized, wait a second. The third girl threw it in exactly right. And so did the fourth girl. And so did the fifth girl. And so did everybody else on the team the rest of the, ma the match. So was he being a jerk by making sure that the rules were followed? No, it was a service. Because it taught everybody what they needed. And if the guy in charge had decided that the rules don't matter, then he should have just left. Because he's the guy that's supposed to enforce the rules to make sure the game works like it's supposed to. If there's no referees, if there's no rules, then there's no football. There's no Olympics. There's no winners, no losers. Everything has to erode and become absolutely nothing. And so somebody and the leaders, in fact, have to stand up for the things that have created what uh, created that reality that's there. And so God's not wrong to discipline us. He's wanting to teach us to make us better. It's not, it's not that way. I mean, could you imagine a referee just loving to blow the whistle? Oh, you messed up again. You're never going to get it right. Like, that's how we assume God is. He's like, no, I told you. Let's do it again. No, no, no. I told you. Let's do it again. Oh, now you got it. Now you got it. And, and, and look, you can't go halfway through the game and then act like you don't remember it. I'm going to penalize you again. We've been over this. And this is what we do with our kids. Uh, this is how a lot of the processes work in our life. And this is how our faith has to work, friends. So, so I guess my question for you today is, uh, is where are you? You know, where are you in the story? You know, um, even Moses made mistakes and got in trouble. None of us are beyond that. Uh, and in fact, I feel like the trouble that we get in, is, you know, sometimes we get in big trouble. It's because we... It's because we have big shoes, and uh, and there's a lot of responsibility. And uh, friends, I think a great temptation for us is to decide that we don't matter, we don't count, that our convictions don't, that nobody's paying attention to them, that nobody's going to see if we touch the line or raise our foot, that that it won't really matter if we keep covenant to God, it won't matter if we have quiet times, and it won't matter if we tell our young people the right way or the wrong way, it won't matter if our neighbors see us doing good or bad. And I think that's the great temptation, friends. It, either nothing matters or everything matters. And and every like lots of times stuff just keeping trying to make me feel like nothing matters. It's just pushing me towards apathy all the time, friends. None of you even want me to be apathetic. Like, you know me. When I'm apathetic, I see you. You're running the other way. You're not taking my calls. It's not good. Everybody in this room needs everybody else in this room to be good. And nobody loves you when you're down and out now. But, but, but we have to figure that out. But look, what we need is you to be good. What we need you to do is, is, is to come up and to be who you're supposed to be and to be, and to be doing that well and to be walking in, in, in cycle with God, Right? If you know not to do this over here, then don't be going and doing it over there. You're breaking covenant. You're messing a lot of stuff up. Don't think that God doesn't see it. Maybe he lets a lot of people get away with that, but is he going to let you get away with that? I don't know. Depends on your record with him. Depends on what you've learned. A lot of people uh, can get away with a lot of stuff when they're in second, third grade, but when you get to be a senior, you, you got to pass those tests. You can't misspell basic words anymore. You can't, you know, you have to be like, man, we, we got to go back. So let's be encouraged today, friends, that uh, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be mean. It doesn't have to be scary. Immediate, in the end, all of these people uh, were a part of God's story. If God gave, paid enough attention to them to care through the whole process. And these stories that are told are for our wisdom. There, so we don't make the same mistakes. Because here, ultimately, friends, this metaphor, we're in the middle of some desert somewhere. 
and we're seeking after a promised land that we're not quite sure how it works. And we have to go cloud by day and the fire by night. And we have to trust our leaders. And we get in trouble. We make mistakes and stuff gets hard and our shoes wear out and our, we get tired. And we start thinking that Egypt was a lot better. We start thinking that sin and the old life and the old ways and all that stuff's a lot better. It's a normal thing to be tempted by all those kinds of things, friends. But the thing we cannot forget is the covenant with our Lord and the things that he has done. The reason that uh, it's good for you now is that you've got to look back and the strength that you have in God is all the stuff that he's done for you before. You know what I mean? It's all that he did for you before. There's an old saying, if after all that God's done for you, he's not going to leave you now. If God took the, you through something 10 years ago and 20 years ago and took you through a health scare five years ago and took you through a financial crisis one year ago, you think he's going to leave you today because you forgot your lunch? That is, that's, an, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a wrong way of thinking about God. God is a father always in covenant with us. He wants us to be strong. He wants us to be brave. He wants us to grow into good and great people. Good and great people that, that, that are good and great, not because we have to be, but because we want to be. And we've been inspired to be by God's leadership and uh, in his goodness to us. That's all uh, I have to say today, friends. I know there's some, we always have to put ourselves in these stories and it can be confusing to us to put ourselves in these stories sometimes or to walk these analogies all the way out. Um, but uh, today, this story is about Moses. It's not about his people. It's about, uh, it could, you could say it's about me and how I've led our church and if I've done good or not. That's how I'm looking at it. But, but everybody's a leader and you're a leader. There's people that follow you from behind, from in front. They're, uh, people don't realize that, that friendships is leadership. I'm so led by my friends, so deeply led and influenced by my friends. I don't see them ahead of me or behind me. I see them on the left and right sides of me. I'm deeply led. And, 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 and often my friends say to me, hey, uh, I appreciate you saying this, or you said this, or you told me this, I've been doing this working. And every once in a while, I get a little glimpse that my friendship has helped them, right? Somehow, so so I think it's not. A, I think it's a short step for you to to assume in this this story today that you are a leader, and that there are people that look to you, and that you are in covenant with God, and you have a history with God, and all that history and all that covenant has brought you up right to today, and 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 maybe the test is about today. And maybe the test is about you and not about all those surroundings. And what do we need to do? We have to gain heart. Hey, so what does it say? Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. That's the temptation, friends. You'll hear his voice today if you're listening for it. His voice will be telling you to do something. Don't harden your heart. Don't go a different way. That voice of following that voice has been your meal ticket this whole time. That still small voice. And so that's what we got to do. Moses, when he was a little boy, he listened to that still small voice of God. He was held by that still small voice of God. All through the goods and the bads, the ins and outs of all his life, it was the voice of God. That's what his meal ticket was. That's what led him forward. And that day, on this day that we read today, he didn't want to listen to that voice anymore. He, he let all his emotions get the best of him. He misrepresents God. He does some stuff in front of the people that are irreversible and he has consequence to deal with. I don't want that to be us, friends. It's written for our instruction. It's written so that God, who is rich in mercy, can say to us, hey, hey, don't, don't hurt yourself. Hey, 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 you see this? Let me head this off for you. Don't hurt yourself. Hey, you see how these people did this over here? Don't, 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 don't do that. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. God's a good God. He's a good father. And this covenant we have is a good covenant. Let me pray. We'll be done. God, we just have to confess to you how sinful we really are. We were picking up trash yesterday, and I was thinking so much about how much trash there was and whose fault is it. There's so much trash, and it's accumulated for so long, and it takes, it takes somebody going through and picking up every single piece of it 
And uh, Lord, that's our work in some ways is to take responsibility, maybe for what's ours and maybe for a bunch of stuff that's not ours. To either step on it and decide we don't care either, to, to give in to apathy, indifference, or, or to just say this is my father's world. Or to look inside and say, you know, I've thrown a lot of trash out myself. I've made a lot of trash for other people. And a lot of people have had to pick up my trash before. And so maybe today I can sit in this and do it too. Most of this spiritual work, God, it sounds so good, but it is so difficult in the end. It is hard to sit with ourselves. It's hard to give a, an account, to, to assess when we were right and when we were wrong. And when we said and did things that didn't work and when we misrepresented you and when we led our entire family or groups down paths that ended up being bad. But here you are today, you're saying, but today, if you're hearing his voice, then don't harden your heart. The opposite is to soften our hearts and to become more sensitive, God, to your voice and what you're telling us to do. And maybe, God, we need to start to think about why. Not always what you're telling us, but maybe the whys. What is the underneath the surface of why these decisions would be important? Or who is looking? Or maybe two and three generations down. Or maybe two or three years after this seed's been planted. Maybe then, maybe that's what you're looking at. And we just can't see that stuff. So we've got to figure out a way to trust you again. So Lord, we just shed our stuff. We... We show you we got a bunch of trash in our yard. We, we need help picking up here. Um, so help us. Help us clean it up, pick it up. And uh, God, give us the also the courage and the strength to see that we're in covenant. And you're not going to break your covenant. You're faithful no matter what. So it's up to us to get, get up, get back on the train. That's what we're doing right now, God. Each of us is saying we love you. Each of us has done a lot of stuff, even this week, that we, it makes us feel rotten and we're not proud of. So, God, we just have to confess it and uh, ask that you would help us to keep walking again in your, in your plan and your purposes. That's our prayer today. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, friends, thank you so much for being here today. We have a couple of announcements real quick. One in particular is this Wednesday night. We're meeting at 6 o'clock at Lost Pizza. Is that okay with everybody? It's a, I, know, I know it's a competitor. I know. I know. <laughs> it's a competitor. It, look, it's double the price. There's a lot of problems with that place. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to go to there. We're, like, we've got to love our enemies. Uh, so that's 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock if you could be there at uh, Lost Pizza. Is that cool? I also want to thank everybody that made it out to the mayor's thing yesterday. The mayor didn't even come, but we went, and we did it. And look, when you walk out of the movie theater, you look around. That Joker out is clean, and we did that. It's clean because we did that. So anyway, that's it. Peace, y'all. See you next week. See you Where? Where did y'all do the ground? Ground. Oh, right. That's what I said.